Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Berlin Baptist Church. It's good to see you all here today. I am so, I'm extra thankful to be standing here this morning. Just got, uh, spent 12 hours on a church bus yesterday, uh, driving back here from, uh, from Homestead, Florida, which is an hour south of Miami. So we were, that's where we were this past week, working and serving and uh, wonderful, wonderful, productive week of mission, and so I'll tell you about that at another time, probably next Sunday, either, probably maybe next Sunday evening, but uh, a lot of work was done, a lot of contact was made with people, and uh, a lot of good experiences that I'll share with you, so just glad to be back, though. It's a different, a different place, a different culture, uh, lots of concrete. Lots of buildings, lots of people, so it's really nice to be back here, if you can understand what I mean. It's nice to be uh, where there's more grass and trees and uh, a little bit fewer people, and uh, it's, it's nice to be back home. So uh, today I just want to mention a few things to you in your bulletin. There's several things coming up here this month that you'll need to be aware of. They're all listed, I believe, in the bulletin for you. And uh, so you can read those at, at your convenience. The one that I'll draw your attention to, especially for this evening, is on the left side. It's actually not in the announcement section. Therefore, this evening is at 6 o'clock, our first Sunday of the month. So it's a community worship uh, at the Wagner Pavilion this evening at 6 o'clock. So we won't have any activities here uh, today in the evening. It'll be uh, over there at the Wagner Pavilion. So... That has become a really neat thing. So uh, if you haven't been out there in these past couple of months, I encourage you to come out and check it out. Uh, it's, um, it's very uh, community-oriented. It's not one particular church that's driving the bus. It's just all of us coming together and being in the community. And, and what's, what I've noticed is uh, being out there, you know, outside, and, and uh, you get some walking, a little bit of walking traffic, but you get a lot of ride-by traffic, and people are really interested in seeing what's going on there when they see a little band set up, and we're singing and playing music, and uh, then there's some preaching. And uh, last time, there was even, they even had um, hot dogs. They had a little meal. For, yeah. So, um, so anyway, there's a, a good thing to be had there, so I encourage you, if you want to come out to the pavilion tonight at 6 o'clock in the in the middle of town there in Wagner, that would be a good thing. All the other announcements you see over there on the right side, and I think they're fairly well in order of occurrence as far as chronology goes. And uh, the only one that's not in there is because it's just not enough room. Uh, the last Tuesday this month, we'll be having our men's fellowship night uh, on the 31st of August. So you want to be aware of that, guys, uh, if you hadn't already made plans to be there. So uh, let me share some scripture with you this morning. I don't want to talk too much. Just want to go ahead and get on with worshiping the Lord. That's what we're here to do. So I want to share just a couple of verses with you this morning from Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is filled with really, really important uh, truth and principle. Uh, lots of, I'm, I'm, I could read the whole chapter. It's only 14 verses, but I just want to concentrate first of all on these first three verses because of the week that I've experienced with um, four different churches coming together from our association and making the trip down to South Florida and and trying to serve and help another church who is uh, in its beginning more of its beginning stages and trying to impact their neighborhood and their community and just uh, they got a facility that they were able to to get a hold of and just lots of work that needs to be done to try to make it to where they can use it for ministry. So we were trying to be able to help them in that. And one thing I noticed about going on a mission trip, uh, first of all, it's just great to be able to go and be on mission after not having been able to do that all of last year. And feel like if, you, if you've ever been on a mission trip, either nationally or internationally and just have some isolated focused time to where you're just it's not about us it's about serving somebody else and just remembering that perspective and how important that is but then remembering that 
our enemy doesn't like that at all. So every time you uh, set, set out to do something like that, there's going to be opposition. And, and there was on this trip, and there was also lots of answered prayers. And so when I read Psalm 27, it just reminds us that um, we're going to encounter some challenges and some obstacles in the course of serving Jesus. Uh, but we don't need to stop serving Jesus just because we get a little bump in the road. You understand what I'm saying? We're, we're, we need to expect that and, then, and pray through it and keep going forward for the glory of God. That, that's what needs to happen. That's what we tried to do this week. And so this is kind of fresh in my mind. Psalm 27, here's the first three verses of Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. The, just, and there, there's more there, but just, just as an introduction to our, our worship time today, I think that's a very important truth to remember. Uh, Jesus is victorious in all things. And that's who we serve, and we don't have any reason to fear. We might come up against challenges and obstacles, but we don't have any reason to fear when we're serving the Lord and sharing the gospel and doing His work in His will for His purposes and His glory. We don't have anything to fear. So let's pray as we prepare our hearts for worship today. Father, I thank You so much for all Your blessings. Thank You for the blessing uh, of being here to worship together this morning. And thank you for the blessings of this past week, being able to serve you by serving others and, it, and advancing the gospel for the sake of the kingdom of Jesus. And I thank you that we are here safely again and uh, gathered in our various churches in this association to worship you. And I pray uh, that your will be done among us today on earth as it is in heaven. I pray we'll experience your presence and your glory and that we'll be free from distraction, that there won't be anything to hinder us from focusing in on Jesus and his word and that as we pray, as we give, as we sing, as we study, Lord, may you be magnified in all things. Help us today to focus and help us to worship you from pure hearts. If there's anything in our hearts or minds or lives that would stand between worship of you today, Lord, I pray you'll, you'll help us just clear it out of the way so we can fully experience your presence this morning. Change us to be more like Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen.
story for this morning is in the garden. where everything is more than I imagined where what is undeserved is freely given all my regrets and my failures all of my wrongs have been left at the cross all that remains is the Father's love oh
Your kindness and mercy remind me how you love me, how you love me as I am. So let us be together, seated at your table in communion. Oh, everyone is equal in your presence. Cause where I am from or where I've been The way that I've lived or the color of skin Nothing will change how the Father loves me Lord, you take me as I am Over and over you call me yours again You see Still you want me, how you love me, how you love me Your kindness and mercy remind me How you love me, how you love me As I am All my regrets and my failures all of my wrongs have been left at the cross Now all that remains is the Father's love All my regrets and my failures All of my wrongs have been left at the cross Now all that remains is the Father's love Oh Lord, you take me Does that ever make you want to go to Children's Church? Sometimes you hear those, all those happy hollering and screaming going down the hallway it makes you wonder what you're missing. Well, if you would, this morning, find your place in the book of Hosea, chapter 2. Hosea is the first of the 12 minor prophets, and we have... We've studied several of them, I think seven of them so far, but we've not gone necessarily in order. We're in Hosea, and uh, we'll be in chapter 2 today. We'll go from verse 2 to verse 13. And I've got a, I've got a lot of thoughts, so I want to try to make the most of my words um, so I don't waste any. In that song that you just heard, the, the chorus uh, of that song said, You take me as I am, over and over and over. Uh, and then there was a portion of it where it said, All my regrets, all my failures, um, yeah, I leave these at the cross. Uh, anything that would hinder me from serving or hinder me from maybe in my own mind. I know you, you probably don't ever fight these battles, right? You probably don't, don't ever have these thoughts where you convince yourself that God can't use you, right? Nobody else struggles with that, I'm sure. But sometimes things happen in your life and you will play these games 
you'll, you'll follow these rabbit trails in your mind, and uh, before you know it, you have convinced yourself that you, you're done, God can't use you, you're, you failed, you, you've got a regret here or a, a, a failure there that you remember, and, and you tell yourself, well, I'm, just not, I'm not good enough for God to do anything with. That's a lie from hell. That's what that is. Uh, because God did never say that to you. And, and God will not say that to you. Because God is constantly offering mercy and kindness and forgiveness. And, and, and praise His name that He is. Uh, that's a beautiful thing. Now, knowing that, and approaching this passage of Scripture today, remember the, the first three chapters of Hosea have this pattern. There's a narrative to tell a story, to set things up. Then there's a passage about judgment. Then there's a passage about hope. And then right after the hope, there's another passage about judgment. And then there's another narrative to tell more of the story. And so the first three chapters kind of have a... Uh, they go one direction go back the other direction. And, uh, but there's a progression. And so today, we're back to another section about judgment, having studied previously the section about hope. And it just goes back and forth, back and forth. And today, there's a very particular message in this passage of Scripture about consequences from sin. Now, is, is, is God always ready to forgive and offer mercy and grace and kindness? Absolutely. Uh, but that doesn't always remove consequences. Does that make sense? Uh, we can have, uh, we can make poor choices, maybe uh, commit sin, and it's just like I always think of the, the, the prison system. All right, that's a good way to look at it. If you think about the prison system, if there's a, a person who has committed some terrible crimes and they go to prison for them, and they are in prison, they hear the gospel, and they get saved. They're going to the same heaven I'm going to, but that don't mean we let them out of jail. Does that make sense? You still have consequences for your actions, uh, but you're forgiven in eternity. So I, I want to try to be clear as I can about that, uh, because today's passage talks about the consequences of sin in the people of Israel, God's children, and how that has affected them, and how we can learn some very, very helpful lessons from looking at their lives, their errors, their consequences, and then, all right, how do I not do that? Because I don't want those consequences in my life. Okay. So hopefully there will be some clarity that will, um, that will happen here as we read through and study through this passage. Hosea chapter 2, we'll begin reading in verse 2. And you, you'll see the text up on the screen if you'd like to follow along or you follow along in your, your Bible in, in your lap. That would be great. Here's what the Bible says, beginning in chapter 2, verse 2. Contend with your mother. Contend, for she's not my wife and I'm not her husband. Let her put away her harlotry from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. Or I will strip her naked and expose her as on the day when she was born. I will also make her like a wilderness, make her like desert land, and slay her with thirst. Also, I will have no compassion on her children, because they are children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She will pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them, and she will seek them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. For she does not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the oil, and lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore I will take back my grain at harvest time, and my new wine in its season. I will also take away my wool and my flax, given to cover her nakedness. 
and then I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one will rescue, rescue her out of my hand. I will also put an end to all her gaiety, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her festal assemblies. I will destroy her vines and fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lovers have given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field will devour them. I will punish her for the days of the Baals, when she used to offer sacrifices to them, and adorn herself with earrings and jewelry, and follow her lovers, so that she forgot me, declares the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you will speak clearly to our hearts today, for your glory and for our good, in Jesus' name, amen. This text of Scripture uh, is dark, it seems. It seems it talks about everything bad that's happened in the lives of these people and the consequences that have then come upon them from the Lord. But it's very specific in what is said, and there's some very specific lessons I believe we can see and learn from this text so that we don't make the same mistakes that others have made. You know, that's really the purpose of life, is it not? That uh, I can learn by my mistakes, but it should be a lot easier if I can learn by somebody else's mistakes. Then I don't have to go through it, right? I can save myself from all the pain and heartache if I will learn from other people's mistakes. So that's our goal today, looking at this passage of Scripture. The first thing that we see here is the warning of coming judgment. It's the warning of coming judgment. From verse 2 down to verse 7, there's a command given right off the bat, contend with your mother. And so there's a lot of symbolism here. I want to try to make that clear so we can get the full effect of what's being said. There's a, 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 a husband, a wife, and some children. And if you remember, Hosea married Gomer, had children that had names that had very specific meanings about the, the repercussions of sin. So Hosea, as a prophet of God, is living out this message that he's trying to preach to God's people to help them understand. But him living out the, the, um, the experiences in his own life is giving him an extra uh, level of understanding of what's going on. Because he's not just preaching a message, he's living it. And so he's, he's fully understanding what's happening because he's going through it at the same time he's preaching it. So he's telling this command is meant for individual Jews who are still trying to follow the Lord. And here's the application for us. Okay, so, so he's saying contend with your mother. In other words, Jews who still follow God contend with the nation of Israel because they are not following me. So the, the remnant, the few that are still trying to, to go in the Lord's path, you need to try to help a brother out. All right, look around you. you got people. So, so let's, let's apply that to us. We're, if we're trying to follow Jesus, does that mean everybody around us is trying to follow Jesus? No. So what's our task? What, what's our job? What's one of the things we should be doing? We should be helping those around us and we should be trying our best to contend in other words share the message in uh, Ephesians says Paul says in Ephesians speak the truth in love so we're not trying to be judgmental or condemning we're not trying to point our finger at people because you know if you point your finger at somebody else you got three pointing back at yourself right y'all ever realize that uh, so so we're not trying to judge people we're trying to come beside our friends and family and, and those in our community and love them and say, this is not what God wants for you. I've been there. Come back to this, you know, let's come back and follow Jesus together. That's, that's what God wants for us. That's, that's our best uh, opportunity to live for the glory of God and experience His joy. So we're called by God to preach the gospel of Christ and call the nation to repentance. Do you believe that the nation in which we live needs repentance? Look around. If you don't believe that, maybe you should, should uh, read a newspaper or watch the news a little bit and you'll see some things 
where I believe our nation as a whole needs repentance, needs to turn back to the Lord. And so Christians are called by God to, to uh, work in that process, preach the gospel, call the nation to, the, to repentance. But in order to do that effectively, what do we have to do? We have to hold on to our integrity. We have to continue steadfast in our loyalty and our love to the Lord because who wants to hear a call for repentance and a sharing of the gospel from someone who is not themselves following in repentance and faith, right? How credible, if I'm, if I'm not, for example... I'm, I'm always asking and, and encouraging, uh, hey, share the gospel every opportunity. Uh, be on mission, okay? So if I never share the gospel and I never go on mission anywhere, what right do I have to stand up here behind this pulpit and ask you to do those things? Doesn't that make sense? I don't have any credibility to tell you, hey, we need to be telling people about Jesus if I'm not telling somebody about Jesus myself, then I don't have any right to tell you to do it. And so what we must do as Christians is preach the gospel of Christ, call uh, the nation, but starting with our community, to repentance. But we have to hold on to our own faith in the process. Because the nation here in this text, and even in our own circumstances, our own context today, the nation as a whole is no longer following the Lord. So when, when God says here in verse 2, she's not my wife, I'm not her husband. That's symbolism for the nation's not following God. These, this is the nation of Israel. These, these are people who are God's people, but they're not following. They're not acting, living as if they're God's people. So we're to contend, but then the text says to... To the nation it, itself, put away your harlotry. In other words, stop serving idols. Stop committing spiritual adultery. Because there's consequences. And the rest of this first paragraph is all about consequences. Look at what the text says, beginning in verse 3. Or I will. See, that's a contrast to say, you need to do this. You need to put away these idols. You need to stop committing spiritual adultery. Or, here's the consequences. Strip her naked the day she was, as the day she was born. So Israel's going to return to the sla state of slavery. Remember when Israel was in slavery in Egypt? And God sent Moses? Remember that for the, for the, the deliverance of the people? So he's saying, you're doing, this, you're doing the same things. You need, to, you need to turn away from this idolatry. You're not worshiping God, is what he's saying. You're not worshiping me anymore. And so you, you do that, you turn away from that, or this is what's going to happen. You're going to return to that same state of slavery. You're going to lose all your prosperity. You're going to have nothing. And, and get this. This is really important for us. Generations to come will suffer because of the sins of the nation. You don't think it's important for Christians today to stand on the truth of the gospel of Christ and to speak it and share it and preach it everywhere we have opportunity because there are generations... I have, I have three children. Uh, many of you have children. There are generations coming after us that are going to suffer the consequences of our neglect of the gospel. Does that, is anybody listening? Does that make sense? The more we turn away from our mandate, the Great Commission, the more we don't do what God says, there, our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren are going to suffer the consequences of our sin. It's the same thing in the nation of Israel. Israel had placed their faith in worthless idols. They believed their prosperity came from the idols. You can see it right here in the text. Their mother, verse 5, played the harlot. She said, I'll go after my lovers who give me bread and water and wool and flax and oil and drink. So in other words, the nation is attributing their prosperity to their idols that they worship. And that, that's another 
problem in their belief system that they've strayed from following the one true God. So God says, well, I'm going to, I'll fix that. I'm going to remove access to those idols. He says here in the text in verse 6, I'm going to hedge up her way with thorns, build a wall against her so she can't find her paths. She's gonna, uh, he's going to prevent access to these idols, and Israel is going to still attempt to worship the idols, but be unable to find them. And it then, So then the, the nation as a whole is going to attempt to return to her first husband. Now let me tell you what this reminds me of. In Luke 15, Jesus tells a story about the prodigal son. You remember it? A father, two sons. The younger one wants his inheritance now. He doesn't want to wait. And so the father divides his estate, gives to each their portion. The younger son goes off, squanders everything he has in wild living, the Bible says, and then he's sitting there feeding pigs one day, and he's starting to become jealous of the food the pigs are eating because he's blown all his inheritance, and he's sitting there just in complete poverty. And so he says, well, I know what I'll do. You remember the story, don't you? I'll go back to my father. And I'll, I'll ask for forgiveness. I'll tell him, I've sinned against God and against you. Please, just make me like one of your servants. I don't even need to be your son again. I just want to be in the house. And that sounds like a good plan, right? Well, in that story in Luke 15, do you remember what the father said when he, when he came back? First of all, do you remember what the father was doing when the prodigal son returned? He was like this. He's standing on the front, I mean, I'm paraphrasing. He's standing on the front porch looking. Wonder if he'll come back today. Oh, I sure wish he'd come back. I wonder, if, and then he sees him far off. He sees him coming back to the house. So, so what, what does God do for us? When we leave the path He's laid out for us, when we stop obeying and we stop worshiping Him and we go off on our own little, pl on our own little plan because we think it's better, does He just say, all right, well, fine. I didn't want you anyway. Does He say that? You know what He's always doing? Try to get this picture in your mind, please, and, and hold on to it. This is, this is so helpful and instructive. God in Christ, is always pursuing us. He doesn't just let us go. He never just lets us go. It doesn't matter how far you get away. Something in you, when you're alone with yourself, will say, this isn't right. I need, to, I need to go back. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit of God. He, he's always looking. He's always pursuing because He wants us with Him. So just like the prodigal son returned, and when he did, he had a plan. He had his speech all prepared. And do you remember what the father did? As soon as the son got out of his mouth, remember, well, here's what he said he was going to say, he was going to say, uh, I've sinned against God and against you. Uh, just, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me one, like one of your servants. And so here's what he said when he got back. The father ran out to meet him, you remember? Get the picture in your mind. Which was very um, dishonorable, almost unethical for a father to grab up his robe that he had on so he could run and run. That was not what the, the Lord of the manor, so to speak, that's not what he would do. But he did because he saw his son. He ran to meet him, and the son started his little speech that he rehearsed and said, I'm, I'm sinned against God and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Then right there, the father cut him off. You remember? Go back to Luke 15 in your, in your spare time and read that story because you need to see the importance of the fact that the the sinner 
thought he had a plan, but the father had a better plan. Okay? The, by the way, the father always has a better plan. Not, not this father. The heaven, our heavenly father always has a better plan. He cut him off. He said, I've sinned against God and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And then the father said, Hey, everybody. We're having a party. My son is back. And he, and he did. He had a party. And so we're not going to flesh out all the things that happened after that. The point of this application here is that God is pursuing us always but we don't get to set the terms of our return. That's important. Jesus Christ has set the terms for our relationship. And we come to him. It's almost like a surrender. Gee, I wonder if there was a song about that. Seems like there is. I surrender a little bit of what I have. That's not how the words go. I surrender all. When you surrender, you are in no um, posture to negotiate. You accept the terms of the victor who is Jesus. And he, he's, he's provided the opportunity for you to return. So just as the prodigal son returns here, the nation should come to their senses and re try to re return home. So the, the judgment is coming. The warning has happened. Now God, through Hosea, tells his people, beginning in verse 8, the second part, the reason for the coming judgment. The first was the warning, and now the reason for the coming judgment. It's sin. Surprise! That's the reason for judgment. It's sin. Israel did not acknowledge the source of their prosperity. They attributed it to their idols. They, then they used the prosperity they had to engage in idolatry. So they had forgotten, and by the way, uh, Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The world and those who dwell in it, he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. God is the creator and he's the owner. Okay, so to, for a, a nation to not acknowledge the source of their prosperity and then use that prosperity to engage in further idolatry is just terribly, terribly wrong and just silly. But there are consequences. So this is the reason for the judgment. God is going to remove all his blessings. Look at verse 9. He just got through saying, they didn't know it. It, it was me. It was me giving them all that stuff. I provided all those things. And then in verse 9, he says, Therefore, I'm going to take back my grain at harvest and my new wine in its season. I'm going to take away the wool. And look at the possessive pronoun. This is so helpful. This is God speaking here. I will take back. My grain, my new wine, my wool, my flax. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He also owns the hills. He owns it all. It would be totally, this might blow your mind a little bit, it would be totally within God's Rights as creator of all things, Lord of all, to say to a sinful people, I'm going to take back my heir. It's all his. It's all his. He is going to remove his blessings. He is going to uncover Israel's shame in this text here. Verse 10, I will uncover her lewdness. And no neighboring nation is going to be able to deliver from God's control because they wouldn't care to and because God wouldn't allow it. There will be no alliance formed with any other nation. It, it, won't, it won't happen. 
And God's going to put an end to Israel's celebrations, all the annual festivals. You see here in the text when he says in verse 11, feasts, new moons, Sabbaths, festival assemblies, all that celebration partying they're doing with all their prosperity because of their idols, he's going to take away all of that, put an end to it. Then he's going to destroy the fruit of the land that was enjoyed by Israel because the nation thought those things were gifts from the idols they were worshiping. And by the way, Hosea is prophesying in the middle of the uh, 8th century B.C., about 750, 760, somewhere in that neighborhood, about the time of Isaiah. And you know what happened in 722 B.C. after this prophecy was delivered to God's people? The Assyrians devastated Samaria, the capital. They devastated the land in 722 B.C. So that judgment... You can't think that God is not serious when he says something. God doesn't play like that. He doesn't joke around. His warnings are never to be taken lightly. So the reason for this punishment was idolatry of Israel. National behavior was similar to that of a prostitute trying to lure customers in. Israel had completely forgotten God. You see there at the very end of this text, this passage today, she forgot me, declares the Lord. The last sentence of verse 13, she forgot me. See, one thing that we can learn from this text is that God has spoken. And if he has spoken, we cannot live as if he has not. He has. And we would do very well to pay attention and to take heed to all that he tells us. We, we would do well today in the year 2021. We're talking about going back. Nearly 3,000 years, 2,700 years. We've got some examples here we could, we could learn about and, and save ourselves some heartache and some uh, judgment if we would read God's Word and understand God's Word and, and actually obey God's Word, do what He says. Let me um, close with this illustration. I've got three pictures I want to show you, and they're somewhat in succession. They're going to remind you of a day 20 years ago. This first one is uh, pretty self-explanatory. That's the, the second airplane moments before it struck the other tower. You see in the background the first tower has already been hit and is already in flames. This next picture is a little bit different perspective immediately after that plane hit the second tower. And the last picture is a view from a little bit farther back That's what it looked like from across the river to people who were outside that morning and saw the devastation of what just happened. So I want to just to try to, to conclude this and try to, to get us all on the same page here. I want to summarize some facts about that week. So, Tuesday, September 11th, that morning, that's when that happened, 20 years ago. So that was a Tuesday. That means Sunday, September 16th, you couldn't find a seat in a church. Do you know why? Because something catastrophic had happened on a national level. And even people that did not follow Jesus felt, I, I, this, is, this is so important and profound.
people who do not follow Jesus, who were not spiritual or religious, still had an internal draw. I need to go to a church somewhere. So, something's got to happen here. I, I, something's wrong. I need to go pray. Or People who don't ever pray were, were going to church. The church I was serving at the time, uh, standing room only. Every chair was filled. People standing around. You couldn't get in there. It was so full. And that was the, the case all across our country on Sunday, September the 16th. But then a funny thing happened. On Sunday, September 23rd, everything's back to normal. Now, I'm not saying life in general was back to normal because there was still a lot of feelings and uh, thoughts and response and things going on on a national level. But churches, I, I used to keep a spreadsheet. I know this, is, this might sound silly, but I used to keep a spreadsheet at that church I was serving back then. And I had, every Sunday, I had the, the date, I had a column for Bible study attendance from all ages, and I had a column for worship attendance for that day. And so, because I, I like to track, you know, try to look at trends and, and see what's happening. And, and I, I looked at those dates on my spreadsheet, and everything was like, if you were to graph it, you used to have the curve going along like this here, and it, you know, a little bit of variation here and there. On September 16th, went like that September 23rd right back there it was a it was a blip on the radar the day the Sunday after it happened people who were not spiritual knew because every human being is created in the image of God and God has placed eternity in our hearts there is a God shaped vacuum in us that can only be filled by Jesus Christ but that doesn't stop people for searching for some way to fill that gap and they find all kind of different things and nothing fits it's like putting the the square peg in the round hole it doesn't fit you can fram on it all you want with that hammer but it's not gonna fit so that one little blip on the radar even people who had no interest in religious things were going to church somewhere. But it only lasted one, one Sunday. And then everything was back to normal, spiritually speaking. So here's the question. Have we forgotten God? The Bible says that uh, Israel as a nation at that time had gotten so consumed in worldly things and idols that they had turned their backs on God. Verse 13 says, So she forgot me, declares the Lord. So I just wonder, with everything going on in the world today, in our culture, have we gotten so distracted and so consumed with worldly things that we've forgotten God? Just take a scroll through social media, any, any one of them. You know what's happening right now? People are going to ball games. Like, I mean, this. It's 1058 on Sunday, August the 1st. People are, are at, going to ball games right now. Eating lunch, tailgating, whatever, going to ball games. People are on the lake fishing right now. People are cutting grass. I got here at the church this morning, 730. 
You know what sound? I, I shut my truck off and shut the door. You know what sound I heard within earshot of this property? Lawnmowers running. Got to cut the grass before it gets too hot. Because that's important, right? And, and here I am, naive and stupid. Maybe I am. But here I am thinking, well, I, I thought church was important. But that's just me. Have we forgotten God? Uh, actions speak louder than words. Let's pray.